let's say, a few uh, top acts to follow. Thanks, thanks a lot, my fellow panelists. Um, so I guess this is a slightly maybe sort of a, a um, uh, it's a very good sort of segue, it's a slightly perhaps sort of separate tack, um, where part of this sort of paper is maybe taking a, well, one of the papers I base on is sort of called a, a view from 40,000 feet, sort of taking a, a, not even a bird's eye view, but a very high level view of what are the changes that uh, technologies in general and AI in particular could have on the global legal order. Uh, and so a lot of this is um, a bit sort of problematic looking at how you sketch out a research agenda. A lot of these sort of strong claims, but lightly held um, for, for discussion. Um, and I want to start off with a, a poem, and it starts out with technology. I used to hope for a breakthrough, and now I wonder what into. And that sort of reflects this um, apprehension. Well, there's sort of lots of hope for technology can do for us and for, and for the world. But there's also a, a pervasive unease that we've, of course, seen a lot in the, in the, uh, in, well, the, the, the last couple of days. Um, what does that mean? And so just to briefly sort of, sort of scope and define AI, um, there's been a lot of discussion over what AI and intelligence and what does that mean? And there's a lot of these discussions over, um, well, I mean, the last survey I, I saw found 72 definitions of what intelligence means. That doesn't seem very useful and often can be misleading over what we think about when we think about AI. I rather define it rather very functionally. So it's a general purpose technology that is, can be embedded into or distributed across platforms or cloud networks or existing sort of software systems or administrative systems. Why do we do this? We use it to aid, substitute for, or improve over uh, human performance in areas like accuracy, speed, or skill. And why can we do this? Is because AI is uh, machine learning systems. It's good at narrow tasks. So we don't have general AI that can do anything, but we have lots of sort of narrowly trained AIs that are good at tasks. But those tasks, though they're narrow, are domain general. So if you can improve something in data classification or optimization, you can use that whether it's in, in banking or in the military or in uh, energy usage. And that is why AI can be used in so many sectors and with so much sort of uh, uh, utility. And so in this paper, sort of look at this concept of if you have something that can be used to do things like data classification, uh, recognition, prediction, optimization, autonomous operation, um, you start eventually getting into um, uh, usages of AI that are um, a very um, uh, sort of disruptive in the sense that they, they start generating sort of global or transboundary impacts uh, or being ero erosive. So we've seen discussions on computational propaganda, uh, discussions over cyber warfare systems or systems that are destabilizing uh, um, uh, sort of pervasive balances of power or nuclear deterrence. And there's a lot of now discussion over also using AI systems to uh, inform and sort of stack the deck in international negotiations. So the Chinese actually last summer started using a um, system, a negotiation support system in their uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs that in informs um, um, negotiation strategies. And so many ask, uh, rightfully so, how do we govern AI, uh, either on a national level or in some of these cases on a global level? Um, but a preceding question perhaps is, what will AI do to the tools of governance that we're, that we're meaning to resort to in, in governing this uh, technology? How will AI affect the efficacy or the viability of international law? Um, and so I sort of base this, I mean, so in the first place, it's sort of important to recognize, this, recognize that this is not new. Uh, Colin Picker has had a sort of study looking at the long history of technology and international law, where technological change either creates the sort of the, nor the political impetus, um, sort of it creates wars that are more bloody than has been seen before. So you get the 30 years war uh, with sort of gunpowder weaponry and you get the peace of Westphalia, uh, you get the first world war with sort of uh, trench warfare and, and sort of again in the second world war nuclear weapons. And all of this feeds into rationales for major new legal innovations. But in some cases also you see that it can undercut legal regimes. So there's the case of submarine warfare, which um, sort of came onto the scene as there were, were sort of international negotiations about sort of international prize court, which is meant to award 
uh, captured ships to commanders and things like that. And of course, once submarine warfare gets on the way, this whole practice of ships getting captured and you having the space to capture the um, and ferry the, the crew back to shore is sort of obsolete. Um, and so in this literature, you can see this sort of theme that technology changes the legal situation directly. So it can create new entities that aren't neatly uh, covered by existing legal structures or can enable more commonly new behavior that's not neatly covered. Uh, or it can indirectly it can shift the incentives uh, or the, even the values of the regulatees that are being, uh, in this case, state parties in the international law system. And so in my sort of roadmap, I look at three ways that you can work through that. So one is sort of the... Um, um, so, so three ways that can change the legal situation and have legal impact. One is th thinking about how, how these changes make AI a problem for international law. What are the gaps it creates in existing regimes and uh, what, what would legal development of these regimes look like to, uh, to uh, plug these gaps? Secondly, sort of the discussion AI is a substitute for international law or a augmentation, the, the sort of legal displacement. And thirdly, could, could AI be a threat to international law? Could it be sort of legal destruction even? I mean, I think destruction may be a strong term. I would have gone with erosion, but then you don't get the DDD sort of alliteration that's so nice. So take that with a grain of, of, uh, of salt. Um, stylistic is, is uh, yeah, nice. Uh, so sort of to unpack that a little bit, I'm, I'm for the legal development, I'm drawing on the sort of uh, um, scholarship of Lyria Bennett Moses, who has made a sort of four-part framework for thinking about new legal situations. And so first she says, okay, sometimes it just creates a legal gap. There's a, just a need for new to, to get, to get generated laws. So we got nuclear weapons and they're new. They're not necessarily covered. Although maybe they're covered by some sort of extant principles, but we basically say that we need to negotiate a new ban that specifically is for this new technology and for nothing else. And you could say, well, maybe politically this might be a problem, but we this is what we're currently working on with the CCW and any discussion over, over lethal autonomous weapon systems. There are new applications of AI in warfare, but we're trying to, to tailor these, these new solutions. So our second um, category is that the legal uh, technological change, or the social technological change, a new behavior or a new entity creates legal uncertainty. We're no longer sure where or how certain extant concepts apply. So you have these concepts of responsibility, uh, command, uh, command responsibility, control, or attribution. Um, and so, and there's a big literature, of course, in the, the autonomous weapons debate over, yeah, so is it the means or methods of war in the, in the Geneva Additional um, uh, Protocol? Um, uh, so the Article 6, or the weapons review, or is it... Is, can we think about uh, yeah, responsibility of actors? Um, and that could be a problem. And this is, of course, it has been the cause of major uh, literatures. And we could see that in other spheres as well. Although there, Burry has argued, Thomas Burry has argued that, well, um, there are actually quite pervasive literatures uh, in terms of case law, international case law, on establishing precedent for state control or attribution. So in principle, all we need is sort of judgment saying, oh, well, that also applies to killer robots. Uh, it's not a question of how quickly that can come, those judgments. But it's a legal development that's needed. It seems possible within the tools of international law. Thirdly is the discussion over the wrong scope. So suddenly we have a new entity or a new behavior that is either um, not covered by the laws when we think, oh, it really should be covered, obviously, or the other way around, it is covered by the laws where we think that, hold on, that's not what we meant by those laws. And I'll briefly jump ahead. Um, so there is, uh, Burry has made this argument. So there's lots of debates over should AI systems have personhood? And there's a big literature in philosophy, on like moral philosophy, do they, should they qualify for rights? Or what are the grounds for that? There's another literature parallel and sort of the well, who knows about the metaphysics of suffering and consciousness, but more about sort of legally speaking, is this something like a case of a corporation? Would it be legally useful to give it rights? Those are interesting and sort of relevant legal debates to have. But their claiming here is that preceding these debates, they suggest it's already been possible using existing sort of company law in a number of states, I think the US, Germany, uh, Switzerland, and UK, to... Um, 
uh, incorporate a lim limited liability company and basically put an algorithm in charge of it. So functionally ascribing legal personhood to an algorithm. And it's basically a legal hack that um, if you're able to do this, other extant legal provisions such as uh, ECJ rulings would mean that if you'd establish this in one EU country, it has to be recognized by other EU countries. And that seems to be this case of like um, wrong scope. You're, you're suddenly saying that the existing laws allow you to give personhood to a algorithm and possibly sort of evade criminal responsibility, and that's not what we meant at all. And so we need to clarify that this is not uh, going to fly. Um, and finally, it's sort of legal obsolescence in, in uh, Bennett Moses' typology. And she it's basically cer certain assumptions that underpinned the existing laws are no longer applicable. And so the first one is basically the conduct that the law covered has been made obsolete or super superseded. And, and there, there's cases where they discuss, okay, so maybe, I don't know, um, laws on, 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 on telegraph, uh, telegraphs and carriers. And it's like, well, it doesn't get invo invoked that, that often. It's maybe a bit of a stretch. I was thinking what a good ar argument here would be. But you could have the discussion over increasing automation of warfare uh, as you get soldiers taken out of the direct sort of uh, theater battlefield um, last soldiers will get sort of captured in at least in sort of uh, pair state combat. Of course, you still have uh, asymmetric warfare. Although even then, if you're flying drones, there seems to be less opportunity to capture uh, uh, soldiers. So that might basically make provisions that are about uh, treatment of prisoners of war a <coughs> sort of like, oh, well, yeah, we, we, we only capture one prisoner of war a year, so it's not really invoked that often. Secondly, um, some of the justifying assumptions behind the rules are no longer valid. So the, the discussion that um, if you have, um, well, uh, bodies of, of laws about labor condition provisions, um, those assume that there is actually a many sort of sub-industries sub or, or um, types of industries that human beings are employed in. And if sort of I mean, current predictions, and of course there's a lot of dis disagreement about this, but predictions are something like... Um, 20 to 30 percent unemployment in 30 years and that might sort of um, shift some of the assumptions I mean there's another discussion I had over um, a human right to work which is not to be fair not as it's always been aspirational and never about sort of states need to need to provide employment um, but it's it's more about you, can, you can't sort of keep people out of employment but basically it's um, uh, has this assumption that it will be possible to give work to everyone and it's no longer possible. And I'm going to speed up because I think I'm late. Um, finally, it's basically, okay, so uh, finally the enforcement of the rule may simply be no longer cost effective. And so one thing is there's been discussions over uh, deep fakes and fake news over the last few days as we've seen. And one sort of concerning use case could be that um, if you're using deep fake systems, and this is basically, people have been using this on desktop computers to recreate uh, scenes from Star Wars, which sort of previously took massive teams and CGI uh, budgets. Um, if you can at scale generate sort of fake evidence of war crimes or human rights abuses and just flood human rights observer agencies with that, um, you both undercut the credibility of your mission because it's easier for other parties to say that, well, um, you're, you, we've demonstrated that some of this is fake. Why isn't all of it fake? But even if that's not the case, you, you're basically able to um, overload an observer agency like that in terms of labor costs, in terms of sort of like going through a lot of these uh, materials and sort of identifying what material is authentic and what isn't. Uh, and so it may become less cost-effective, at least in that way, to enforce those those rules. Um, so that creates a number of sort of holes uh, or possible gaps in international law that we need to think about how to um, plug them. Secondly, um, AI is a substitute for international law. There has been, uh, so this is the personhood, there's been discussion, of course, on the domestic level over like, oh, well, can we... Uh, automate law. And, and does that transfer to the international law level? And there's two, two versions of this argument. One is the, uh, well, can you use it in uh, adjudication? Um, and that, um, sorry, first one is, like, can you use it to enforce uh, laws uh, and to monitor? And that actually seems, in some cases, quite possible. So there is actually a 
Uh, Pulse is a system that's used for um, predicting where poachers go and sort of to help uh, wildlife preserve uh, security sources to intercept poaching, um, poaching groups. Uh, this is Sentry, which is a system used in Syria to give advance warnings to citizens. Uh, so it basically predicts where airstrikes are going to, to or be likely to arrive based on uh, what they claim, machine learning. And again, what people claim AI. So, um, and, it, and it's a way of sort of giving advance warning to sort of civilians in a war zone. So it seems there could be some utility in using this for monitoring compliance with treaties in the same way that we've used nuclear sniffer planes or spy satellites to attack the compliance. Uh, there's another version of that which is like, well, um, I mean, we've had the discussions over um, yeah, uh, administrative decision making. Is that something that you can scale up to the international law level? It seems a bit unlikely, especially Burry has made this argument that the on domestic law, this works because like things like tax law or um, uh, or cases like patent law cases are very large, homogeneous, there's enough data. In an international law context, the data sets are too heterogeneous, um, too unstructured, and so the, and there's, yeah, thanks. And it's sort of vulnerable to, to data poisoning, and there's, of course, the legitimacy problem. Who's going to accept this? Who is going to code and train the ICJ AI? That doesn't seem likely. Another version, um, and we've had the discussion, I think, in the last few days of over... Um, so similarly with Professor Kingsbury over regulation by infrastructure or non-normative technological management, um, can you change the technological environment of states to change their behavior? And that seems, well, there's some cases like discussions over geofencing autonomous weapons. Basically, they drop out of the sky if they, if they cross borders. Not sure if that works because it's easy to get around that. Uh, and many applications don't seem to work that well, especially because you need states to su submit to that. And it doesn't seem very promising. Finally, um, one minute to do this thing. AI is a threat to international law. Um, so there's two versions of that. A soft version, which is basically, we found all of these legal gaps uh, or problems that need to be addressed. And it's just going to be unlikely that um, international law will have the versatility to adapt to it. And, and then that will basically create a pretty effect efficacy problem. These problems will go unsolved, and a legitimacy problem because it will become increasingly visible that law isn't solving this. And especially because sort of neither, like most of the useful, the usual tools of international law are not really adequately prepared to dealing with a technology like AI um, for a range of reasons. And I'm going to skip past. Um, uh, but most importantly, is sort of the hard argument that AI might facilitate a shift towards unilateralism in general. So uh, some scholars like Harari have already suggested that it creates a premium on centralized data processing. And and, um, and so basically, in the past, democracies outcompete autocracies because they are decentralized. And this is why we won the Second World War, allegedly. Um, and in the future, that will no longer hold the case. The differential advantage will go towards autocracies. More problematically, and this is a very like steep claim, but the argument could be that whatever benefits states previously sort of believed, like especially like major like Security Council, the Permanent Five perceived that they they achieved by uh, engaging in the international legal order, they might now perceive that they can achieve these through unilateral use of AI capabilities, like enhanced surveillance, computational propaganda. We yesterday had a talk by uh, Dr. Cowell on how social media and AI. Propaganda that might undercut sort of reputational sanctioning. And so if that's the case, it's, it's a bit of a problem because the same leaders in AI development are also major parties on which international laws, at least on at least their sort of um their their non-interference um international laws a bit dependent on that. And this is not to say that AI unilateralism is the is the only factor or the major factor uh, or the determinant factor that's challenging the international legal order right now, but it may speed up the, the decline of multilater multilateralism. So I made, sort of putting that together, I made a bit of like a, you can organize this in different ways. Um, I haven't, there's a lot of question marks here, but you could, this is a way you can organize approaches to thinking about what are the problems AI throws up for international law. Is it something that can be automated or substituted for? Uh, is there other opportunities of using AI to strengthen international law? Or will AI erode the sort of political scaffolding or the um, 
the, the normative software. And so I want to finish with another uh, poem, because I like poems. Um, and they have seen the last light fail, by day they kneel and pray. But still they turn and gaze upon the face of God today. And God is touched and weeps anew for the lost souls around, and sorrows turn their pale and blue, and comfort is not found. And this is by the GPT-2 AI system, uh, limited release. So this is the, the, the limited version of the system. The full version was not released because they were too worried for how it could be used. So thank you very much. <laughs>